Well, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I'm Greg Freeby, the Executive Director of the American Segmental Bridge Institute, but serving with you today as the Chair of the National Concrete Bridge Council, who's helping bring these webinars, this webinar series to you uh, this year into early next year. Uh, for those of you uh, who may be not aware, the National Concrete Bridge Council is a consortium of uh, a group of allied industry organizations. You see them here on the left-hand side of the screen. There are currently 10 members uh, of that organization. And we're really all about helping promote concrete bridges. And one of the things that we identified in some strategic planning a couple years back uh, was the need to help the industry in terms of what we just have sort of termed stewardship. That is taking care of our existing structures. And uh, we asked the uh, International Concrete Repair Institute to join our ranks uh, to help bolster us uh, in that effort. And uh, we're excited to be then participating uh, in these webinars uh, that Vector Corrosion Services came to us um, and sort of pitched a great idea so this is the third session today in a six part series. Uh, if you missed the previous three sessions, that's fine. Those recordings are actually available through the same uh, registration link you used to register for the webinar today. And you can also register for the upcoming uh, webinars and you can see here on screen, the topics we'll be covering uh, January, February, and then wrapping up uh, in March. At the end of our session today, we will do a live question and answer, a moderated Q&A session, uh, and to sort of incentivize folks to participate in the Q&A, we're offering a $100 gift card for the best question uh, as picked by our presenter. And so I encourage you to participate. Of course, you need to put in your name. We can't give a gift card to someone if you're anonymous. Uh, and again, it's unlimited on the number of submissions. And so uh, don't wait until the end as you have questions in your mind as we as we progress today, go ahead and uh, pop those questions in uh, into the, the Q&A. So our speaker today is Mr. Matt Miltenberger, who comes to us with 35 years of experience in the concrete industry. Matt is a vice president with Vector Corrosion Services uh, has extensive experience in uh, the areas of concrete evaluation, concrete materials, service modeling, and corrosion mitigation. And more specifically, his uh, expertise that he's going to be sharing with us today is in the area of impressed current cathodic protection. Uh, I think you're gonna find, uh, having seen the slides ahead of time, uh, a lot of material covered today, but really good, really useful information. I think you're going to find really helpful. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Matt and uh, go on mute and silence my camera as well. So Matt, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Greg. What I'm trying to do today is I'm going to try to give you a, a brief primer, okay, uh, of how you do cathodic protection and press current system uh, designs. How do you evaluate it? And, and we're going to start a little bit from how a corrosion cell works in reinforced concrete so you can get an idea of how the um, corrosion activity is changed when you apply a, an impressed current system to it. And, and we're try to go through some of the fundamentals. Uh, this is sort of like a primer of how do you do a design, but you have to kind of understand how, uh, what goes into the the calculations and um, how you properly distribute the current to a system. And we're gonna the, we're gonna end up with uh, a little bit of on electrochemical treatments, which is um, essentially a temporary impressed current cathodic protection system. So. Here we go. Um, a corrosion cell in concrete, the number one thing that is that's going on and causing damage to concrete structures is corrosion. Chloride induced corrosion is is everywhere. It's in the marine at atmospheres, it's in industrial plants, it's in it's it's underground, it's in the water. Um, and in order to have a corrosion cell, there's four four items. 
One is the anode, and that's where the rust is formed. And then the other is a cathode. So that is a location with no section loss, but that's where a, a compatible reaction. So here's two parts. It's a redox reaction, a oxidation and a reduction reaction. The oxidation goes on at the cathode, reduction goes on at the end. So you have a metallic path and an electrolyte, and the electrolyte in our case is concrete, and it, it should be moist because the resistivity of the concrete will uh, change the, the path. So here's how it works out. You have your anode reaction. The anode reaction is your iron going to an iron ion plus releasing two electrons. The current flows through the, the concrete in an ion, uh, ionic path. So here's your anode, and it's normally in concrete about 350 millivolts versus a copper sulfate electrode. And then you have your cathode. Your cathode is where the the oxidation or the oxygen is reduced. Oxidation occurs at the anode, reduction occurs at the cathode. So the cathode steel is at a different potential. It's a couple hundred millivolts. So it could be positive too. So there's a potential difference between the anode and the cathode, and that's this voltage drive. And what's the only thing that is throttling it back is the resistance of the concrete. So if it's moist, this concrete resistance is low and corrosion goes on rapidly. If it is dry, this concrete resistance gets very large. And so the corrosion reaction can get throttled back. And if there's no moisture, you see you need water for this to go on and if there's no moisture available then the corrosion uh, is actually stopped so the voltage drive is a function of the current and the resistance so keep this going so if you have a high voltage a driving voltage is essentially constant because your your anode and your cathode are a couple hundred millivolts apart and the only thing that really changes is the resistance over here so the lower resistance the higher the current oh let me see here if i can back up it's not letting me back up um uh oh there you go so here's your anode this is what it looks like in this case there was a piece of garbage a piece of plastic that was left in the bottom of the forms and that initiated corrosion here on this on this bar and you notice there's a stirrup that ties the two bars together but there's clean steel right just a, an inch or two away from the anode here's another anode this is another anode and here's cathode and here even on that same bar you can see over here that it's there's a cathode area right next to it. So an anode and cathode are always next to each other on in the concrete. It, it seems like and the wetter the environment, the longer, the further apart those anodes and cathodes can be. Like if you're in a concrete pile in the water, the the cathode would occur above the water line. The anode would be under the water line and the most active zone would be right at the water line. And it, this damage occurs because the corrosion products swell. And here, you know, a relative size for iron is, you know, one. So essentially when it starts to corrode, it switches up and there's a whole bunch more oxides available uh, than, than what's shown here. And they're, they, they all range from you know, around seven to, to two to seven. Typically, you're going to see somewhere around four, three to four is the uh, expansion that you're going to see from most of the reinforcing steel in atmospherically exposed concrete.
and you can see it leads to spalling and delamination and you can see this one here was actually shock created and this was repaired shock created shock creed. they didn't do anything about the corrosion they just covered up the the spall and then it failed again so if you want to do something about corrosion cathodic protection is the main goal the main uh, tool and you can do it there's two different types there's a galvanic and an press current and what we're doing here with cathodic protection is you have an anode that throws current through the concrete onto the steel in a galvanic situation this is exactly the same thing as if this galvanic anode were the anodic location on the piece of reinforcing steel it's throwing current through uh, to protect the steel in the cathode zone and if this is a different metal say it's aluminum zinc or magnesium those are the three primary anode materials this galvanic material will throw current onto the steel now if you put copper over here this whole thing switches around because the steel will want to try to protect the copper. So this is just something you've got to be aware of. This galvanic corrosion is going on within the concrete before you put any kind of a, a system in place. If we have an impressed current system, which we're going to talk about here, you have a, an inert anode that is used to throw current through the concrete to the steel. And it's connected through a power supply. So there's a metallic path. This is the wire. Remember our, our ACME. You've got your anode, your cathode, metallic path, and the electrolytic path. And impressed current systems, we're putting power through the uh, between the two, which allows you to adjust the system. So what you see, this was our previous little circuit where you had an anodic steel, cathodic steel, the currents flowing around here. But when you apply an external anode, it throws current down here and it onto the, the anodic spots. And what you're trying to do is balance, balance off the corrosion current at the anodic spots overwhelm the anodic spots and make no current flow through this branch so then all the current flows from the anode through the cath and makes all the steel a cathode and the corrosion rate becomes negligible at uh, at the protected steel so here's another way of looking at it when you take steel and you apply current to it so here's your log log i so that as you increase the current in this direction when there's no current you're going to get what's called a native potential this is what you you measure with your half cell and when you apply a little bit of current this might shift it may not shift much but once you apply enough current that you're you're starting to overwhelm some of the corrosion sites you're going to see some potential shift and once you get a potential shift that goes to a point where all of the anodic sites have been overwhelmed the the shape of the curve goes linear and you'll get a potential shift with each incremental increase of uh, of current so here's data from an actual project where we we took uh, we did a polarization test to identify what the corrosion rate is. So if you take a polarization curve and you take the linear portion and the um, native potential, you can get a corrosion rate. That's what this dotted blue line is. We're going to provide cathodic protection so we have we do this test and we say okay how much current does it take 
to get a hundred millivolts shift so that I'm over in this linear portion. Hundred millivolts is the minimum. Normally we go a little bit further, but what I what it shows is in order to get your 100 millivolt shift or to achieve cathodic protection, you need to supply a current or a current density that is slightly greater than the actual corrosion rate of the reinforcing steel. That's a fundamental concept. Just stick that in your pocket and we'll need it later. So here, this is a great little, uh, nomograph from uh, the NACE report, uh, TR21463. Um, it was just uh, put out a couple years ago, 2020. And what it shows is that if you have a potential that is more positive than minus 200, the steel is passive. So, you, you know, you don't have a corrosion problem. And if you've polarized the steel beyond this curve and you're down in this region, you're 100% protected. And normally that occurs with a potential shift of a uh, potential of around minus 720 to 730. And if you're in this region, you're 100% protected. In pipelines, they go to 850, um, but, but in, in concrete, reinforced concrete, um, they've shown that if it's more negative than uh, 720, where uh, you're, you're protected. And then if you are in this region and you don't have enough polarization, um, well, here's zero, right? So if you're in this region, you'd have, you'd have not enough polarization, you'd be up here. This portion of the curve is this region right here. And then once you you get past this um, polarization, you get 100 millivolts or more of polarization, then you're, you're in this partially protected region. Above that, you're 100% protected. So once you have 100 millivolts, you are protected. If you're less than 100 millivolts, there's some protection, partial protection. The more, you know, protection you have, the better. You know, if you're like at 95% or 95 millivolts of shift, you've got essentially 95% of the steel is protected. And that all changes when you add different levels of chloride into the into the mix. So if you have typically 0.8% by weight of cement is what you're going to find in a marine environment. Uh, anything above that would be in a uh, industrial setting, most likely, or in like a salt storage bin, something like that. And, um, and, and typically in those uh, severe environments, we go for 150 millivolts. And this comes out of the same uh, report, uh, TR21463. Um, so now you have an anode, you have a situation where you know you need to have a cathodic protection system. You've got a lot of corrosion going on. So how does this work? And in a lot of cases, this is an application. In a lot of cases, it's just atmospheric chlorides and you have corrosion on these balconies. Now, what happened here is they cleaned off these balconies. They had a lot of repair. This was an old conductive coating system that was in place on this structure and uh, it had been consumed the rectifier had uh, been you know it, it, they they have their electronic components so they have limited life so we were replacing the system we removed the old coating we did all the concrete repairs around the edges and patched it up and then we put a conductive coating on it then we put a top coat on it, and then they installed uh, the top coat is a decorative top coat, and um, then they installed the lanai screening around the rest of the uh, the balconies. And and this was a conductive coating system. So how that works is you have a power supply, 
that delivers the current through a platinum wire that is coated or covered in the coating, you basically increase the thickness of the coating right around the platinum wire. And uh, then the coating is applied just like it's a, it's a water-based paint. So it, it's filled with carbon black and it um, conducts the, the current very well. These wires need to be uh, less than 10 feet apart. Eight to 10 feet is, is pretty normal. And that way you don't have any um, uh, current drop within the within the, um, the the coating. And what you see here is illustrated is that most of the current is going to go to the first layer of steel, and some will make it to the second layer. And so you have to uh, figure out how much current you need. In these systems, they are limited to about one milliamp per square foot of coating. So if you've got a lot of reinforcing steel, this conductive coating isn't going to work for you. It won't provide enough current. And this is what it looks like when it, the coating is applied. And then we they have a, an overcoat. Um, it, they're both acrylic latex paints. Um, another system is a mixed metal oxide mesh overlay. Um, here you, you can kind of see it. It's kind of small. There's a, uh, a roll of mesh that's just rolled out onto the bridge deck. Once it's been milled and, and, uh, and, and cleaned up, ready for an overlay. Um, a lot of it's, this one was done with hydro demolition. And um, you, you run these down, you tack them in place, you weld these, these joints and you connect them together with a, uh, a electrical, uh, a titanium electrical conductor bar. And these have a much higher current um, rating. You can see here is around three and a half milliamps per square foot. The current limit on the conductive coating is about one milliamp per square foot. And um, so this has a lot more capability for bridges. Um, if you're, you're in a highly um, uh, reinforced structure. Uh, also, you have to deal with the dead load when you're doing an overlay. It's essentially the weight of the overlay. And um, here's another application where they were doing some repairs. They put in a, you know, a, a slot repair here, and they put the mixed metal oxide over. This is a sidewalk uh, adjacent to a to a bridge. And here's the circuit. You can see you're you're applying the the current through a rectifier, making sure all the reinforcing steel is electrically continuous and the, the anode delivers the current. Another type of system is metallizing. And in metallizing, what you have is two, is essentially an arc welder with, a, with compressed air. And you have two wires of pure zinc that are coming together and there's a couple other alloys that can be used, but zinc is the predominant version. And those alloys come together and this welder uh, brings the electrodes together and it'll arc and the compressed air blows these little droplets of molten metal onto the concrete surface. So you can't just sit here and spray it and create a big puddle. You have to go back and forth over it and, you know, uh, east-west direction, then a north-south direction, and then you do it in, in like two uh, or three passes to build up the thickness uh, that you or that it's designed for. And these can be um, impressed, impressed current can be done with this, and it's done a lot in Oregon. Uh, they do a lot of their bridges with metallizing. They just make sure that there's no short circuits there's no tie wires coming out of the out of the concrete that that reach the surface, and then you would have a, a short. Um, but a lot of them are just straight metalized, and um, and and then you energize them to control the the uh, the consumption rate of the zinc. And then there is also a, a conductive mortar and a plaster that can be done. These are all their surface applied systems. And then we have a ribbon anode system. 
this is as you can tell this area here was was already grouted in place and down here they're they're cleaning up and they're getting ready to do the grouting down below and um you can see it's kind of a, a messy system it 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 it, it it's not aesthetically pleasing. So most of the time on these, they are coded over, over afterwards. And uh, what we had going on here is we had a, a ramp that went between different levels from parking garage. And then we had a radial feeder, that uh, conductor bar that came out here. And that occurred at a couple places on the on the plan. And that's where we, we made connections to the rectifier. And these ribbons come in different sizes, and you, you want to make sure that you have enough concrete cover to um, to put in the right ribbon size. So if you you have a half inch cover, this isn't going to work. You know, you have to have normally for half inch or three quarter inch ribbon, you're going to need two inches of cover. And if you're going to try to use a one inch, you're going to need three inches of cover. I've only seen one inch used in uh, marine applications where they have more cover. Here's a cooling tower that we, a project we did, um, the same sort of thing. You're running the, the, you're cutting the slots, you put the ribbon in, and then you're gonna grout it in place. And you get the, the this trowel is holding the ribbon up off the bottom while they, push the grout in and then they they strike it off. The guy behind him is is striking it off and finishing the, the joint and they just go around and around and around. Here's a, another application for ribbon anos. This is a new construction and it's kind of hard to see here, but there's two layers of reinforcement. Um, you have the inner layer and then an outer layer. And so the inner layer is where it was uh, the, the anodes were attached to these rebar clips. And um, then we have a, a structure connection. This is where you you clean it up and it's a, a, a brazed stud. This is called pin brazing. This is a pin brazed stud. And then this whole thing would get a, uh, covered with epoxy so that all your connections, different metals uh, are not exposed to the electrolyte. And this is a reference electrode. And then there's ceramic uh, discrete anodes. Uh, these are called Ebonex. And um, you these are put into drilled holes and the wires are run into uh, these little slots. And you could see them. Now these have a much higher current output and they come in all different sizes from like one inch diameter down to you know, uh, three eighths inch diameter and different lengths. I've seen them two feet long and I've seen them four inches long. Here's an idea of how they would look in plan in a section view. Um, what you're trying to do is throw current from the interior of the of the concrete to the reinforcing steel on both sides. We only had uh, access to it. This this wall was three feet thick at this point and so we put the anodes in the center and um, we brought them out to a junction box and um, we went from you know we made all your electrical connections to the rectifier through conduit okay so now you got a different idea of how these what are these anode types now how do you actually design it right so you have to know what the current demand is and the current demand is a you know a function of the surface area of reinforcing steel you also have to consider anchor bolts any kind of embedments form tie anchors that are left over any bare copper like grounding cables um, you have to consider the effect of all the metals that are inside the, the concrete so Calculate the summation of all the of the areas, and then you calculate the resistance of them. Uh, one of the things I'm looking at in my design process is I take the surface area per unit square foot of slabs per unit 
linear feet of a beam or column. So I figure out what the reinforcing steel per unit length is, and then I can design the system based on you know one unit length and how many units there are. Then you have temperature. This is uh, an example of the Arrhenius equation. Um, this shows that if you have a different activation energy and it, you know, the, the temperature influences the reaction rate. Well, since corrosion is a chemical reaction, this 100% applies. In concrete, we're dealing with about a 30 kilojoule per mole uh, activation energies, 30, 25 to 35 is where we normally normally see it, um, and it kind of fluctuates depending on the um, environment, how, how much chloride or acid or sulfate, what kind of concrete you're, you used in the, in the beginning of the, of the job. You know, it's like, where did it start out? If you had a high resistive concrete, you, you may have a, a lower uh, activation energy just because it doesn't see as much surface area. And here's data from a real job, and um, we we had data loggers collecting data on uh, a bridge in Ohio for a couple years, and this is just the data cloud based on temperature through the winter times into the summer times, and you can see that curve. This is all the same uh, structure that was galvanically uh, uh, protected. This is a shape that you can see, and, and you can see here, this is the range that you see for dry concrete is an order of magnitude lower than for moist concrete. I've never seen anything as high as what they, they recommend. This is in the uh, Cathodic Protection Specialist course manual. This is a range. Uh, it's, it's, it's closer to this on, in moist concrete than it is uh, this side, but uh, most of the time you're you're between you know one to two milliamps per square foot. And that's what this is. Uh, the remember I was talking about the chloride concentration at the steel and and the um, current density that you need uh, for cathodic protection. Well, that's what this is. If you have a lot of chloride in your structure, you're going to need, you know, a higher current density, around two milliamps per square foot. Most structures fall in this range between one and two, but, um, you know, if you have carbonated concrete or it's new concrete and you apply a cathodic protection system, you, you get what's called cathodic prevention. Essentially, you're throwing current onto the steel through your anode system to prevent corrosion from initiating in the first place. And you can get away with a whole lot less current density in that case. Um, the British standard uh, is right here, 1269, uh, 12696. Uh, they have an appendix in there that they basically tell the the designer that you use 0 0.02 to 2 milliamp. Uh, well, let's go, and that's for square foot. 0 0.02 to 0 0.2 milliamps per square foot for cathodic prevention. But for cathodic protection, it's an order of magnitude higher. It's 0 0.2 to 2 milliamps per square foot. So. For current demand, buried or immersed structures, one to two milliamps per square foot. And you, you, it normally will stabilize and will drop below a half milliamps per square foot once it's once it's uh, the system is operating. So uh, you don't have to, you still have to design for the initial uh, current, but over time it'll stabilize and you can use a lower value for uh, determining the life of the anode. Uh, in atmospherically exposed structures, there's more oxygen available. They have a slightly higher uh, current demand. And uh, when you deal with pre-stressing steel, you have to be careful not to overprotect it. 
you have to control the instant off potential. This is just the, the voltage that's it's got to be more positive than minus 900. So if we uh, went to one of those those slides, remember when you polarized and you start dropping down, you just can't go way down that that uh, that curve. Um, OK, now. You figure out how much current you need, then you have to figure out what the circuit resistance is. So the resistance of the steel, that's the cathode. And what you do is you calculate the, the resistance of the bar. It's like in, down here, this is your bar. It's a distance away from the surface. That's your cover depth. You follow this, you calculate all the vertical bars. Then you take all the horizontal bars. And normally I do this in a square foot or lineal uh, foot of, anno, of, of column. And then I multiply or divide by the uh, number of square feet and I get the resistance of the system. So it's it's pretty simple. Um, if you if you get there, then you do the same thing for the anode and the anode is a little bit more. Um, is a little bit more complicated because you have to deal with a manufacturer uh, normally has an anode resistance uh, and, and then you you know you have to decide the for a surface applied system what that resistance is by the by the area. And so you have your anode resistance, you have your steel, your cathode resistance, and then you have to deal with the concrete. And so if you look on, um, let's see if I can get to this other, you go back here, this is the resistivity of the concrete. So I normally have to design it with a, a range of resistivity for for the concrete so that I deal I can cover the the dry environment when it's potentially dry and then when it's moist like when it's raining um, and then you have the resistance of the wire and you have to factor that in and for the discrete anodes we have a, a, a slightly different formula that if, if you're if your anode if there's the T is zero so if your anode is up right at the surface you can use this formula and if it's recessed you use a slightly more com, convoluted uh, formula but it, it works here's your wire resistance this is just just a standard table you can get from any wire supplier uh, off the internet, you know this is all the you know pretty much standard for. They have met. I have it here in in U.S. units, uh, Imperial gauge units, uh, but it's uh, you have the same thing for for metric wires. And thing you want to be aware of is that you have the resistance of the wiring within the zone, and then you have the home run. If you have a long home run you have to have you have to factor in the the voltage drop across that home run wire and if you've got a header wire I like to double it back I like to use a loop so that I feed both ends of the wire uh, both ends of the anodes you know so you have the same voltage on both sides okay the reason uh, for that is that there's a voltage drop in the wire and um, if you be the same voltage on both ends, then uh, you cut the voltage drop in half in the middle. So it's it, it, it's just a it's one of those things. Sometimes I apply current to a a zone of anodes at midpoints and at the ends. Sometimes it's four points. A lot of times I just you, you can just do it from both ends. It all depends on the length of the run. So you have to calculate what the voltage drop is in the header wire. Excuse me. And um, you normally have to use, uh, uh, you have to upsize the home run wire um, a little higher. It's going to be higher than for the current demand because you're dealing with DC and you have to deal with uh, the voltage drop. And like I was saying, the current drop in the zone is, is one of the issues that you have to worry about. Um, as you can see here, this is a 
mesh overlay system. You can see how it's fully uh, state, uh, pinned down here with these plastic, what we call tris Christmas tree anchors. And then here you see this wire that's sticking out. And then back here, there's another one that goes all the way across. That's here. These are the conductor bars that are welded to each one of these strips of uh, of mesh. And that's how, it, and this goes back into a uh, hole that's been cored in the concrete and a electrical box is placed underneath that. And so these bars, these what we call CD current distribution bars, uh, these CD bars go into the hole and go into the box, and that's where you make your wire connections. So they're all accessible. Then all this gets covered with with concrete. And here's how that distributed bar works. You have your current delivered by the rectifier, and it it's applied right here. And each one of these sheets pulls current away from it. So the current drops from one end to the other on the CD bar. And it's a relatively linear. It's actually stepped, but it's it's kind of you know just approximated by a linear uh, drop off. And um, within the mesh, you have your current that's delivered, and then you have the resistance of the mesh that Current is high here and it drops off to nothing here. Same thing with a CD bar. The current is supplied at one end, drops off at the other. Now, if I apply current at both ends, then I have I have this dropping down from one end to the other, and the net result is like a little concave um, current distribution. So it becomes much more uniform. Um, when you apply current, uh, apply your uh, current to both ends. Some projects you just can't do it. It's just it's logistically impossible. So try to apply the current to both ends of your system if you can. And then the voltage drop. You have voltage drop through the concrete. We're, we're talking about the resistivity and everything. Well, when you have bar that's closest to your anode, it's going to get most of the current. and if you've got a deep slab, the bottom steel may not get as much enough current to be protected. And this is for like an eight inch slab. You know, I was getting about 30% of the current being delivered to the bottom steel. Um, the top steel is the steel that was getting chloride contaminated. It needed most of the current, so it, it all worked, you know, but this is, something that you have this is a check a design check just make sure the bottom layer gets enough current for protection now another thing another application a lot of people don't realize is that there's steel framing inside a lot of these old masonry buildings uh turn of the century 1900s or you know all these buildings are 100 plus years old um they have reinforced uh they they're structural steel embedded inside the masonry and uh, as you can see here they they marked out a a groove here for or a slot for um, bringing in the wires and what we're trying to do is protect this steel so you open up the steel you make uh, structural connections these are your your wire connections um, they put a bunch of them here in this one location because that's the only stone they wanted to remove, but the steel is electrically continuous all the way across. And um, so what's normally done is the steel is exposed, it's cleaned. Uh, you're gonna grout it back. And here you see they put mortar in when they, when they put the stones back in, and then you put the anodes in, um, in the slots, it, the wires in the slots. Um, Here's a, a drawing that gives you an idea on that, uh, where the anodes were located. You see the dotted line here is this, the steel beam. You're trying to put them above and below and then in between the, the steel beam. And you have to pick the locations um, that you can. Um, next, 
here they're installed. Uh, we, we installed from the, both sides on this project, inside and outside. Here's another bridge, or no, another uh, project, steel frame. And um, we'll just go through. You can see the same sort of thing over and over again. You have to order these. So press current, most often applied to an entire element or a structure. The system voltage uh, can be adjusted after installation. That's the key advantage. And the external power supply must be monitored and maintained. That's a cost, but it is, but it allows you to make sure your system is, is working properly. And when you make your electrical connections, they must be durable and they must be maintained. So design it so that you can maintain the, the electrical connections and everything that's uh, in, inside concrete should be welded or uh, coated in epoxy. Short circuits have to be avoided. And then if you use uh, cathodic protection on impressed or restressing steel, you can uh, you can get acidification of the concrete at the anode and you can cut hydrogen embrittlement of the steel. So now electrochemical treatments, this is gonna go relatively quick. Um, it's the same thing. It's a temporary impressed current system. And here's how it, it operates, a little cartoon. You put a temporary anode in, you have conductive media, you've got chloride contaminated uh, in, the, in the cover around the reinforcing steel. So you connect to the reinforcing steel, you connect to your anode, you apply power, and then once you apply power, the voltage gradient around the steel will push the chlorides towards the temporary anode and will realkalize around the area around the uh, reinforcing steel. In order to do this, you wanna do your concrete repairs first. Then you put up your anode. In this case, you can see the temporary anode is just welded wire and fabric spaced off with um, basically lath strips. They're, they're like uh, furring, they're, um, yeah, they're furring strips, three quarter inch. And then you spray uh, here, they're, they're using uh, cellulose fibers, spray on insulation. Then you wrap it and you put a, uh, inside here there's a, will be a, a soaker hose so that it stays moist. And then you, you wrap it to keep uh, evaporation from going on. You want this all to be real moist. And you can see what, how it was done on uh, the Kansas City Viaduct. This is their arrangement, the wiring. It all comes up the, I thought there's some boxes. You can barely see them, but there's some boxes on the backside here. Um, and everything was monitored for uh, a month or two months. And then that uh, pulls all the chlorides out. Burlington Skyway, this was done 30 years ago. It's still passive. You can see here the chlorides at the reinforcing depth. Um, here's the reinforcing depth. This is a chloride profile before uh, treatment. Then during and after the treatment, here's the chloride profile. We've just reduced it. It didn't get rid of all of it, but it got the chlorides at the reinforcing steel below the chloride threshold, and it realkalized the steel so the steel becomes passive again. And here's your potentials. 20 years later, there's no active corrosion. And um, same thing with realkalization. What you're doing here, though, is you're going to put an, elect an alkaline electrolyte in the in the uh, soak through the soaker hoses, and then force that electrolyte into the concrete. And here's a bridge, nice. It's a Tri Canyon bridge. It's uh, 1921s is a landmark. That's what it looked like before, you know, and and uh, it was all carbonated. There wasn't any chlorides involved and there was some uh, corrosion damage. Um, a lot of places here on the on the edge. So they did the uh, realkalization on it and it, excellence and you got a excellence in uh, uh, restoration by uh, the Oregon ACI chapter. And uh, that's it.
sorry if I took a little longer. <laughs> no, perfect. We, we are, uh, I think, just on time here, so we'll get start getting through these questions. They're starting to pour in. Uh, great presentation there, Matt. So uh, we'll keep rolling with it here with uh, a question from. Sorry, my mouse stopped working. Here we go. Um, I guess this question would actually go back to one of your uh, first pictures, but from John, he was asking the picture showing the pier cap uh, with the rest of rebar. Uh, where is the cathode in that picture? So I think that was right at the beginning with the. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe. Creed. Yeah. OK, let's see if I can. Uh, We've got a lot of slides here. Yeah, and I, and I, <laughs> I hit the button, the, the bunch of times. So. Faster. Yeah, let's see if we can get up here. I'm not sure which one you, you think it's in the beginning. This one. Yeah, I believe it was slide 10. Fine, that would be 10. OK, yeah. In this one. Well, this was, you know, this was taken after they removed everything here. Where's the this is all the reinforcing. Where is the cathode? Well. Um, that's a good question. The cathode here is probably on either side of it. It could be the reinforcing bars inside that are not that are that, that haven't spalled yet. There could be reinforcing up above. Um, but but this whole side was it looks like to me if you you have a bridge right here with you see the joint. You had salt water that came down and ran over it and it, when you get to this, this was a very heavily contaminated structure and uh, the cathode is, is just probably one of the interior bars. Um, so another question here, what is the typical life expectancy of an ICCP system? They're designed typically for 25 to 30 years and what limits you is the electronics and the wiring most of the time. The anodes are by design electrically inert, so they become, um, they stay in place. And as long as you can replace the, the wiring or um, update the uh, rectifier over time, you may be able to get 50 or more years out of a system. Um, you know, I, I, that I don't know too many systems that have gone that long. Um, 30 years, I've seen 30 years where you have the rectifiers inside um, in a, you know, the parking garage where the system was uh, installed. All the wiring was done with um, titanium, you know, connections. Uh, all the everything that's in the concrete is titanium. That's all good. What was all the wiring was done through electrical boxes underneath and the wiring needed to be replaced and some of the connections needed to be spruced up but the um, the rectifier power supply was in a, a dry it, you know it's underneath it's in the maintenance uh, shed and that was still good after 30 years but i've seen rectifiers that are outside uh, die in 15 years so it, it all depends on where where it's located and if it's getting you know salt spray on it and stuff like that it it's it may not last very long and you might have to replace the rectifier uh, in in 15 to 20 years but everything that's embedded in the concrete if it's done with the durable materials and connections made properly and sealed uh, they they can last 30 plus years. Right, and so a key thing would be to uh, make sure that these systems are, are monitored or checked up on to make sure that they're still running. Uh, which kind of leads in, which kind of leads into Dan's question here. He says, does it make sense uh, to have like a smart meter that can uh, turn up and turn down the current of uh, an ICCP system depending on the environmental conditions? Or is there going to be maybe some issues with doing that? That's a great question, Qu quite honestly, is because it's something I didn't um, I didn't cover, but because 
the environment changes. If you apply a constant voltage to the through the impressed current system, the resistivity of the concrete changes with the environment it, and also the corrosion rate. They run in parallel. So if the environment is conducive to corrosion activity and you have a constant voltage supply, the the, it'll deliver more current in that environment. And then it naturally will regulate as the concrete gets drier and or wetter. And um, a constant voltage is the way I normally do atmospheric uh, impressed current systems. Uh, oh, originally, people were applying a constant current. And when a system would get really wet, it, like in a rain, say a hurricane came by or something like that, and it was wet for days and days. The the concrete would get way too much protection. The current would go through the roof, and um, and then when it's dry, the voltage would climb very high because it's trying to deliver all this current as the resistance builds up, and it and it uh, it caused a lot of problems with the rectifiers. So most of the systems today are constant voltage, and the concrete will adjust the the current as needed based on the environment. Does that make sense? I know it was a long question, long answer. It was an excellent answer. Uh, Rishad asks, uh, cathodic protection works, uh, or sorry, does it work for already corroded bar and uh, will it, what, can it help recover the cross-sectional loss uh, no. of the bars? No, okay. Yes, it will work with already corroded bar, and no, it will not recover any section loss. If you have a structurally deficient uh, structure, your your reinforcement is, say, in this case on this slide, if these stirrups were broken and you didn't have, you'd have to add uh, additional stirrups for structural capacity, and then the cathodic protection system would be installed after the structure is sound. Uh, one here, uh, what type of conductive grout would you need to be using or does the resistivity of the repair material around a impressed current system uh, affect it, uh, its performance? Most anodes are embedded in a conductive grout. The idea here is to reduce the current density at the anode uh, to grout interface. So like you saw the, um, let me see if I can get to it this way down here, the picture of the masonry anodes, we installed them with um, what's called a uh, EboFix grout. And the EboFix grout is, it's got some carbon black in it. And you see this right here? This is the anode that's covered with the, with the uh, grout. And that allows you to throw current from the hole, from the edge of the hole instead of the edge of the anode. And that makes the anode last longer. So you can use a conductive grout and you can use a um, a, a high resistance grout uh, but they they need to be flowable and they need to be non-shrink because if you have a a grout that cracks around the edge of the hole then you have just separated the the anode from the the structure so it has to be a non-shrink grout and i've used it i've used most grouts uh, that are non-shrink or quality grouts, um, they will work. But when you're using these uh, ceramic anodes or if you're using the the ribbon anodes, I, I recommend using the EboFix grout. Excellent. And I think that's all the time we have for the questions on this episode. Um, if you guys have any more questions, you can get them in now as well as uh, 
we'll have uh, Matt's information here on the screen uh, in, in the next slide and uh, you'll be able to contact him as well as all the questions that have been submitted here. We'll be uh, getting those over to Matt and he'll be, uh, be able to get back to you and answer some of those. Just another reminder to sign up for our next event, which is uh, coming up in, in the new year in January. And uh, with that, thank you, Matt. Yes, thank you, Matt. We uh, appreciate your, uh, your presentation today. We're very informative and uh, we look forward to our, uh, our presentation in January. Thank you, everybody. Cheers, everyone. Bye.